In this year's Halloween special I took a look at 8 games with creepy, spooky, 16 color EGA graphics. This video is a re-edit of all the prior episodes. Now sit back and enjoy the EGA nightmares. Our first game in this series is the first person point and click horror game Personal Nightmare from 1989 developed by Horrorsoft. Horrorsoft is mostly known for their Elvira games or Waxworks and funnily enough Elvira is featured prominently in Personal Nightmare as well even though she does not even make an appearance in the game. The game places the player in a creepy isolated town where your character must investigate the mysterious disappearance of their father the town's vicar. The town's plagued by supernatural occurrences with demons and other horrors lurking around every corner. Gameplay wise you can definitely see similarities to the later games where you also interact in the environment from a first person view and try to solve puzzles and survive. Personal Nightmare is the only EGA game in the series, later games from Horrorsoft all used VGA graphics that look really great. On the other hand, I think the EGA style with the 16 color has its own very spooky atmosphere, maybe just because they remind me of a time where I was much younger and much more afraid of any horror themed games. From what I've played, the game seems quite obstruse and difficult, so that's definitely not a game that you can just go through in a single playthrough. And there are many opportunities to die, and you also seem to have this real-time mechanic where the time ticks on and some events only happen during specific times, so you really have to be lucky to be at the right place at the right time. Unfortunately, the game also released before sound cards were widely available, so you only have some PC speaker sound effects that don't have the best quality, though it's still quite impressive to have digitized PC speaker sound effects at all, though I think at least a little bit of music would have been nice. Generally, I've definitely dug the atmosphere of the game and it's a nice entry to get into the Halloween mood. I hope you had some spooky fun and see you in the next episode. <laughs> Welcome, Welcome to the last half of darkness. Of darkness. Good, Good evening. evening. Good evening indeed and welcome to our next EGA horror game. Or well, you might have noticed the word VGA there in the title. That's just because what you're seeing here is a bit of a newer version of the game which originally released in EGA and we are going to switch over to that but I just wanted to show you the cool PC speaker speech effects and I couldn't get them to work in the original version unfortunately. Go away. Last Half of Darkness was the first scary game I ever played on a computer. And believe me when I tell you that this game scared the shit out of me when I was young. I was a bit of a scaredy cat back then in general, so I couldn't watch any horror movies without hiding behind the couch. But this game really was intense in my opinion and I had to stop playing several times because it just got too exciting for me. At that time I also didn't own a sound card yet, so having speech over PC speaker was really something special and made the game so much scarier because, well, the game generally is completely silent, but sometimes when you get a jump scare you suddenly hear these voices and yeah, that was amazing. That's why I scoured the internet for over two hours to get the right version that actually plays these speech effects in DOSBox. You will find the download link to that version in the description of the video. The story revolves around a mysterious letter received from a deceased relative urging someone to investigate a creepy mansion. That mansion is filled with supernatural elements like ghosts, vampires and dark magic all tied to a family curse. As the narrative unfolds the plot delves into themes of witchcraft and forbidden rituals which explain the dark forces haunting the house. Now besides the dense atmosphere the game was actually quite fun to play. 
It's similar to the personal nightmare, the game we talked about before, but it's a lot simpler and easier to play. You can still easily die in the game, but you will get rewarded with a nicely drawn ghoulish picture of your demise. I also very much enjoy the writing of the game and the environment of this spooky house, which reminded me a lot of classic haunted houses where you go from room to room waiting for the next jump scare. It just felt a lot more exciting than Personal Nightmare to me because, well, there was just more stuff happening and every room had the potential to be scary, whereas Personal Nightmare starts a bit slower but builds up over time. Admittedly, there's a big chance that that's nostalgia speaking out of me because I did play Last Half of Darkness in a dark room and I have vivid memories of that time, whereas I've never played Personal Nightmare before. The game had been released as shareware, but the different versions of the game are really a bit convoluted and confusing. Besides shareware and full versions of the game, you also have the VGA version that you've seen at the beginning. And I've read on the internet that there are no death sequences and no puzzles in that version, but that's simply not the case, so I think the person that wrote that had played the shareware version probably. Anyway. I couldn't find any differences between the VGA and EGA version of the game other than the frame in the UI. So all in all, this is a nice little creepy game for Halloween. I hope you had some spooking fun. I see you in the next episode. If you're enjoying this Halloween special, how about subscribing to the channel? There are many more retro gaming and adventure videos here and there will be many more in the future so you get notified if there is a new upload. A Nightmare on Elm Street, legendary movie series, not so legendary computer game. Still I can imagine that this game would have been quite scary if I had played it back in my youth. I mean just looking at the title screen, this is the stuff nightmares are made of. The game very roughly follows the plot of the movie, so Freddy Krueger is out there capturing kids in his realm and it's up to you to free your friends and defeat the evil monster for good. The game starts with a character selection, where you can select from 5 different kids that all have their special abilities. After you've selected one, the others will get kidnapped by Freddy and it's your job to rescue them from his realm. The game is split in two parts, in the first you run around a city maze hunted by Freddy himself and trying to find his house. The location is randomized, but in general this is not a big challenge, you will find it quite quickly and the first phase is over. After that the real game starts, where you run around a maze, defeat enemies, pick up items and try to fight the exit of the level and rescue your friends before they die. You have a bunch of different resources and ammunition, but the main ones are your power, which is your health and if that reaches zero, Freddy will kill you and the other one is soul, which is your energy that you use for different actions in the game. The game pretends to be a bit more deep and complex with all the different items you can pick up, but generally it's rather straightforward, killing enemies, using levers and find the exit to the next level. You only have a single action button, that's context sensitive depending which item you have selected with the mouse on the right. So killing an enemy for example mostly boils down to standing next to it and hitting the action key. That said, it's really nice how easy it is to get into the game because many games of that time were rather obscure and you had to read a manual to even understand what you have to do, but this one you can figure out on your own. What was a bit disappointing to me is that besides the very start and the end of the game, Freddy never really shows up in person, which in my opinion is a bit of a missed opportunity that could have made the game a lot more suspenseful instead of constantly just fighting these generic enemies. The game had also been released for the C64, which is basically the same game but with worse graphics and there has also been a Nintendo version, but that's a completely different game and a side-scroller. And yes, if you've wondered, that Westwood on the title screen is the same Westwood that later became Westwood Studios and released the Command and Conquer games for example. I hope you had some spooky fun and see you in the next episode. The 
desert, unchanged for millions of years, yet witness to a biblical prophecy come true that one day the meek shall inherit the earth. had to show you the Amiga version first. That intro is just dripping in atmosphere. Cinemaware did a commendable job trying to port this to MS-DOS, but well, at the time, the DOS PC were just no match for the Amiga's graphics and sound capabilities. Still the gameplay and most of the atmosphere are very intact in this version as well, so you can still have a haunting experience hunting down the ants in It Came From The Desert. The story is set in 1951, in the small desert town of Lizard Breath, where a geologist named Dr. Greg Bradley discovers something disturbing after a meteor crashed nearby. The meteor caused ordinary ants to mutate into gigantic, aggressive creatures threatening the safety of the town. It's up to you to convince the town folks that the threat is real and with their help fend off the mutated intruders. It's an interesting mix of adventure, exploration and minigames. You travel through town on a real-time clock, talk to people, try to find evidence for the existence of the giant ants and then fight them off and in the end you kill the queen and save the town. The production value of the game was just unheard of at the time. There are so many different location characters and they are all chock full of animation and detail artworks. It's just a pleasure to go around and look at everything. Which is a good thing, because the game revolves a lot around trial and error. You will probably not be able to complete it in your first playthrough, but it's still fun exploring the town and everything for your second or maybe third playthrough, because those locations and characters are just interesting and the whole game is drenched in this eerie atmosphere, making this whole experience one to remember. Unfortunately, the minigames are a bit hit and miss and probably not up to modern standards, as well as the controls which unintuitively don't support the mouse even though you have a mouse cursor but you have to move that around with the cursor keys or well with the joystick if you play on the Amiga. But those are things that you can get used to and in no way lessen the one of a kind time you can have with this game. You've probably already gathered that I'm a big fan of the game and actually I've developed my own spiritual successor It Returned to the Desert which is available on Steam and that does come with full mouse support and turn-based tactical combat instead of the twitchy minigame from the original. Check it out for a spooky time and I will see you in the next episode. Jerome. It's been a while. I'm very sad to announce you that Julia died. Isn't that high quality voice over? Oh well, more text to speech. And this is the Scum VM version which sounds a lot better than the original DOS game. Still at that time having a game fully voiced must have been quite an experience. Mortwell Manor is a detective adventure game originally released 1986 for the Sinclair QL, but then ported to the Atari ST and Amiga and MS-DOS. The later versions with much improved graphics that have been quite impressive for the time when the game came out. The player takes on the role of Jérôme Lange, a private investigator. The story begins when Jérôme is called to Mortwell Manor by his old friend Julia, who urgently requests his help. Upon arriving, he finds out that Julia has mysteriously died and it's up to him to investigate her death. I'm going to show you some of the creepier scenes here from a stream from Julia Minamata, because I never actually got that far. And shout out to The Crimson Diamond, a really great modern adventure game paying homage to the looks and the gameplay of the earlier Sierra titles. Mortwell Manor was a really overwhelming experience for me. There are so many different actions you can do on each room and nobody tells you what you're supposed to do besides, well, finding out what happened to Julia. 
So I more or less just stumbled from room to room, talked to everybody until everyone was pissed off at me and didn't answer my questions anymore. Then I started picking up random items until I found out that your inventory is very limited and then I was caught snooping around and had a game over. Still I very much appreciated the murder mystery atmosphere throughout the mansion and the different intriguing locations that really made me want to find out more about what happened here. Yes, I would have definitely appreciated a more modern user interface, but with some trial and error I was able to figure out how to play the game. What was a bit disappointing though was the repetitive dialogue, so if you ask different people about stuff they don't know, they will all answer in the same way and generally the dialogue is rather short and not that interesting to read. Which is a bummer because I think these murder mystery games really thrive on their quirky characters and your interactions with them. In summary, I think this game might be interesting to some of you that have played almost every DOS game because, well, it's really rather obscure, but if you're just getting into DOS gaming, this would not be the first title I would recommend. I hope you had some spooky fun watching this video and I'll see you on the next episode. This image of Hugo's House of Horror has really burned itself into my brain. This spooky and cartoony house with a big yellow moon in the background fits the Halloween theme just perfectly. Thus it was a bit disappointing when you first enter their house and the backgrounds lose that cartoon charm and get a bit more bland with less details. Still the titular House of Horror is interesting to explore and you find many great spooky tropes like vampires, crazy scientists and even a mummy. Even though the game might not be put together that well, the amateurish charm that comes through adds to the overall atmosphere. It's a bit like a teenager created that game to impress his friends. And looking at a photo from David Gray, the developer of the game, that might actually be not so far off. The first game of the series, the one we are looking at here, is shareware, but if you want to play the others from the trilogy, they are still commercially available from his website. In the story so far, you are in total control of Hugo's destiny as he searches the haunted house for his sweetheart Penelope. She was last seen going into this house on a babysitting assignment. Well, then it's probably just all a big misunderstanding. To rescue your sweetheart, you are playing a typical parser based graphic adventure, similar to the early titles from Sierra. Similar as well is that you can die a lot in this game, but at least I don't think you can get in any dead ends and as the game is very short, you can probably play through the whole thing in under 30 minutes, it's not that big of an issue and actually rather fun. The text parser is not the most eloquent, but it's serviceable. And the puzzles are more on the easier side as there are not so many rooms, items and characters or combinations of them to try out. The most egregious part of the game to me were when you had to throw a lamb chop at a dog in a very specific way or when you had to run away from a mummy with almost pixel perfect movement. If you're looking for a bite sized Halloween experience with a lot of nostalgic charm, I can definitely recommend playing this game. As for the sequels, I have not got around to play those yet, but maybe that's something for next year Halloween. I could even throw in Nightmare 3D, a 3D action adventure set in the same universe where you have to free Penelope once more. I hope you had some spooky fun with this one and see you for the final episode tomorrow. Manhunter games are really a fascinating, creepy experience. The surreal atmosphere really hooked me, especially considering how it was made using only 16 colors. It's amazing to think that the siblings Dee Dee, Dave and Barry Murray created this dystopian world with such limited technologies. Dee Dee's haunting, pixelated landscapes and post-apocalyptic cityscapes set the perfect tone for a Halloween game night, don't you think? She became an award-winning wildlife artist, which makes sense considering the artistic skills she brought into the pixelated world of the games. The eerie, desolate environment she crafted with her brother Barry feel both minimalistic and surreal, and the lack of dialogue makes the visual storytelling even more powerful in my opinion. In an interview, her brothers Dave and Barry said they were heavily inspired by alternative comics and dystopian films like Blade Runner, which I think is quite apparent in the game's oppressive Orwellian tone. I particularly loved how the unsettling silence and bizarre alien designs added a layer of tension to the whole game. 
In Manhunter New York, the first game, players assume the role of a human forced to work for the alien overlords known as the Orbs, who have taken over the city. As a Manhunter, you secretly investigate human resistance movements while uncovering a grisly murder mystery. In the sequel Manhunter 2 San Francisco, the story continues as you pursue a renegade across the city, unraveling a darker conspiracy behind the Orbs control. The gameplay is also rather unique, as you are not using a text parser that was usually used in the games from that time, but it's more like a point and click interface, unfortunately not controlled with a mouse but the keyboard or the joystick, but I think it works well enough after you get used to it. The game is also played from a first person perspective, so you don't have a character moving around directly, but you have these beautiful full screen views of all the locations and many very impressive detail shots throughout the whole game. Besides your typical puzzle solving, you also have a lot of arcade action minigames, which I am not such a big fan of. Even though you have a difficulty setting, at least in the second game, these are still quite hard and can become annoying quickly. But I guess that's also down to personal preference. When I'm playing a point and click adventure, I don't need those, but if you're more into action games, then this might be your cup of tea. You can and will die a lot in these games, but it's very appreciated that you will get set back right to before you died and you can just continue playing and don't have to worry about saving or loading the game. I did not encounter any dead ends in the game, but take that with a grain of salt as I did not have the time to finish both games, so there might still be some in the later parts. What I did find quite cool was this device you have where you can track the movement and actions of a person in this abstract digital way so you can try to follow up what they did and try to find out what really happened. It's a great and intuitive tool to visualize what you actually have to do in the game. The sound and music unfortunately is only PC speaker and I think Tandy sound device but that doesn't seem to sound any better so that's a bit of a bummer but well what can you expect from a DOS game from 1988. So would I recommend playing these games today? Well, maybe not playing, but definitely check them out. They are a one-of-a-kind experience blending horror, mystery and dark humor in a way that was way ahead of its time. I hope you enjoyed this little special series over the last few days and with that I think there's not much more for me to say than Happy Halloween and see ya!